hey and thanks for joining in today on mechanics and material fe review civil 22 and um i'm super excited to get started here i love mechanics and materials it's one of those one of those uh topics that's just super important when it comes to structural engineering uh structural design and just in general your understanding of structures i had a professor once who said if you can understand shear moment diagrams you can really understand the way structures work. And, and one of the ways he would gauge how much people knew was by how much they understood shear and moment diagrams. So here you can see that's the first topic that comes in the FE civil spec, right? So this, this is taken literally from NCES. It's, if, you have, if you want to go to the link, you can click on the link. Um, but, but the first thing is shear and moment diagrams. And also, just you know, you can download all these problems. There's a link below if you haven't seen them already. So definitely take a look at them feel free to follow along um, anytime i have minor updates i'll publish those here and hopefully the sound's working okay i know the last time i did this the sound was a little bit uh not the best so if uh it, if i do have any issues let me know but we'll just jump in here because we're going to talk through um, mechanics materials and that looks like shear moment diagrams uh stresses and strains uh, different types of stresses and strains deformations and combined stresses and it's interesting to note that in the manual, in the reference handbook, it talks about buckling, it talks about some composite analysis, but those actually get thrown into more structural design and analysis. So we're going to leave those there. Today, we're just going to really hit on these topics. So let's just dive in. All right. So we're going to, we have a, a long session tonight. Uh, hopefully they won't go super, super late, but um, I'm excited for this and hopefully it will uh it will help you out some as well so with the first question here all that we're doing is we're doing a shear moment diagram and specifically we're given a beam with a width of 50 centimeters depth of 100 centimeters it's subject to the loading below okay you can see here we're going to ignore self-weight but what does it say it says that the magnitude of the moment that causes the maximum bending stress in the beam due to the applied loads is most nearly so this is a great uh a great problem just to get get started with shear and moment diagrams. But before we do shear and moment diagrams, we're really gonna have to go and solve for uh, some reactions. And, and honestly, you don't need to solve for everything, but you do need to solve for some things. And with this, one of the things that I, I think I told my statics class is that every single test you take is gonna have reactions in some way, shape, or form on it. So this is one of those skills that's just, you gotta get it down to that like one to two minute thing in, in for the FE. So if you if you if you want to pause, I don't know if you're watching the video later or watching it now, but try to do the reactions here because the reactions, right? What are we going to do? We're going to start by summing moments about point A, and you could sum moments about point B, but I like to get both reactions uh, if possible. So if I sum moments about point A, the other thing is that's kind of consistent for me. I kind of know what I'm doing with that, so it makes it a little bit easier. So if I sum moments about point A, what do I have? I have eight kilonewtons coming down. Uh, times a moment arm is six meters and that's going to be a negative moment the reason it's negative right is because this is causing rotation that is uh, clockwise that's opposite of our positive sign convention so that's going to be called negative so we're going to start with negative and the five kilonewtons is the same thing that's also going to be uh, negative so five kilonewtons times the total distance here this total distance well six and four and three is going to be what 13 meters so what do we get? Five times 13 meters. And then we're gonna add by times, well, six and four is gonna be uh, 10 meters. All that has to equal zero. And we can plug that into our calculator and hopefully uh, we can get the right answer. But what do we get? We get eight times six plus five times 13. And I'm gonna divide that by 10 uh, to get 11.3. I just wrote zero for some reason, but it's 11.3 kilonewtons. Okay. So that works, hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're just gonna jump in and we are going to do some of the forces in the y direction equals zero. Again, anything up is gonna be positive. So basically AY plus BY, those are both gonna be positive. Then we're just gonna subtract off uh, the eight kilonewtons and the five kilonewtons, and that's gonna equal zero. So what, what does that give us? Well, if we plug everything in, uh, basically we're going to get this 13 here. We're going to get, what, 8 and 5 is 13. 13 minus 11.3. That leaves us with, I think, 1.7 left over. Reactions. Super important. It's the basic statics that you need to know in order to get be successful in strength of materials. But if you can get there, that is going to be super helpful. So when I go to share moment diagrams, some of you learned these with 
integrating load to get shear, integrating shear to get moment, and then integrating more to get deflection. And you can do all that, but you don't need to on the FE. Honestly, on the FE, what you need to do is you need to take it, kind of simplify it down a step. And one of the things that I love about teaching in a, in a slightly more applied uh, program is in some ways we, we, we do it the way that it's done in industry. Um, honestly, like if you're ever hand checking things, it's a lot easier to do it um, the, the applied way than the, the calculus way, in my opinion. But some people like things differently and to do things differently. But what I want to do here is just to share in a moment, right? right that's what the, the question is asked for. It says the magnitude of the moment that causes the maximum bending stress. So this isn't going to positive negative bending. This is the biggest moment, right? We have a rectangular section, so we don't have to worry so much about the, the positive and negative aspect of this. We're just going to take the biggest moment is going to cause uh, the biggest bending stress. So if we jump in with that, um, when we draw shear moment diagrams, the easiest way to do it is just to follow the loads. So if we have a, if we come up to 1.7 kilonewtons here, we have no load in between the A and the 8, there, point A and, and the 8 kilonewtons. So what's going to happen here is our load or our shear diagram is just going to come straight over and then it's going to drop 8 kilonewtons uh, because that 8 kilonewtons is going to bring it down. So if we do 1.7 minus 8, so 1.7 minus 8, Going to get us down to uh, negative 6.3. We're going to come straight over again. By is going to bring us up 11.3. So if we add 11.3, we'll get back to uh, I think it's five, which makes some sense because we come back and then the five closes us down here, right? So just the basic shear shear diagram, right? And if we go from here. What we want to do next is we want to do a moment diagram and, and hopefully you remember to go to the moment diagram, right? What we want to do is we just want to go ahead and kind of integrate this area. And again, you could do this the, the calculus way or I would suggest the non-calculus way here because we have rectangles. Um, we could label these areas A2, A3 or A1, A2 and A3. And really what we're going to do here is it, one of the things that I want to point out is we have two points where we hit zero moment, right? So two points for zero moment, that means we're gonna either have a max or a min, right? So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna basically come and if we find these areas, like area one is equal to what? It's just, well, 1.7 kilonewtons times how many meters up here? It's six meters, so six meters, and that's gonna equal 10.2. So you might be tempted just to stop right there and hit the 10, 10 kilonewton button and, uh, you know, go from there. So we could do that, but you don't do that because it would be wrong. Okay, so what we have here is 10.2 kilonewton meters. And I could go find A2, but realistically, one of the things that I want to show you here is the area three, right? This area three is almost a little bit easier. And it's really the only one that we need because what we know here is area three is gonna be what? Area three is just equal to uh, five kilonewtons. I forgot to label that one, but five kilonewtons times its distance or you know this three meters here times three meters. And that's gonna give us what? 15 kilonewton meters. So if you remember anything about your moment diagrams, um, this negative area of A2 is going to bring us down to where? To negative 15, and then we're going to come back up to zero. Okay, so this is going to be negative 15 kilonewton meters. And really what we have here is the, the, biggest, the biggest moment that we have to worry about is going to be our 15 kilonewton meters. That's going to be the one that's going to cause the biggest bending stress. Do you remember the bending stress formula? The bending stress formula is FB equals what? MC over I. We'll find that later on tonight. We'll go look at the reference handbook. But the biggest moment, whether it's positive, wrong color there, the biggest moment, whether it's positive or negative, is going to give us the biggest, um, the biggest bending stress for a symmetric section. If, the, if it's not a symmetric section, it kind of goes out the window a little bit but you have to be a little bit more careful. But for a symmetric section, when we're told that this thing is a 50 by you know, 100 centimeters up here, that's gonna allow us to, to know that the biggest moment is gonna give us the biggest bending stress. All right, so we can say with confidence 
here that the answer is this 15 kilometers. Make sense? So, so zero shear. So yeah, so we start, yeah, the maximum moment comes at the points of zero shear. Maximum moments comes at the points of zero shear. So where this crosses the axis is going to be maximum moment. All right, we're just getting warmed up here. But again, if you can remember, if you can remember a couple things, if you can remember beam reactions, it's gonna be huge. We're gonna hit beam reactions over and over again tonight. So I'm just gonna kind of fly through those a little bit, but hopefully they make a little bit of sense. We'll talk more about bending as well as we get into this, but, but hopefully this is just a, yeah, okay, I remember a little bit about shear moment diagrams. I can make this work and I can do this. All right, so let's go to question two. Question two, another diagram another shear moment you know another beam that basically reads the same way but we have a beam with you know with the six inches and in, by 12 inches so this is pretty similar here um yeah so so why didn't i do a2 sorry i'm just seeing the the comment here but why didn't i do a2 i, I could have done a2 i i could have totally done a2 a2 is equal to uh, minus 6.3 times four meters what's that minus 6.3 times four it's gonna be negative 25.2. When we integrate to get this moment point down here, right, we're just adding basically, if, if I call this the moment, you know, moment two or whatever, or moment at B, uh, okay, so the moment at B is just gonna integrate from left to right up to B. So the moment at B is just gonna be A1 plus uh, A2, and my big fat head's in the way, okay? So I could have gone there, and the moment at the end, the moment at the end is just gonna be equal to a1 plus a2 plus a3. So I could have gone that way. It, either way is going to get you the same. I guess one of the things that I wanted to point out though, uh, thanks for the question by the way. One of the things that I wanted to point out with this is you can take a look at this beam here without having to do any reactions, right? So without having to do any reactions, you can get the moment of B just by doing five times three. You see that because it's a cantilever, because it's a cantilever, I mean, essentially, you could cut this beam right here and find that moment independently. And then the only thing you'd be really worried about was this other peak down at this point. So again, it's, it's just if you can kind of look at the, the question and what it's asking for. I mean, if it just asked for the moment of B, you wouldn't have to do a whole shear and moment diagram. You could just take literally, you know, the five times three and get the cantilever moment. Okay, so... Uh, uh, maybe I'll work through this one, the next one, a little bit more, um, and maybe not. We'll see. Let's let's go there. Okay. So again, shear moment diagram. And what we're going to do is we're just going to start with reactions. So with reactions, I'm just going to sum moments about point A, make this equal to zero. So what do I get? Well, I know that I'm going to have you know this this A Y, and I'm just doing an abbreviated uh, free body diagram here. I have A Y and B Y. So what do I get? I get well, I'm just going to start with, and this time with by times 20 feet, and then I'm going to subtract off. What am I going to subtract off? I'm going to subtract, subtract off two kips per foot times 10 feet, right? That's this length of the uniform load times its moment arm. So its moment arm, it's going to have a resultant sort of in the middle here. So that moment arm is going to be what? It's going to be 10 feet over two. So I know that I need to basically... I can square the 10 uh, divided by two. But this is, you know, we have the moment arm here and that's gonna work. So this one actually works out pretty easy. I can do the math more or less in my head, but if I cross out the twos, I get by times 20 equals 100 uh, kip feet. So I get by equal to what, five kips. Okay. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. But again, these reactions, hopefully you can get these reactions down where they're pretty quick. It's you can get them to the point where they're a couple minutes, they make sense. And if not, you know, definitely, definitely practice because that's one of those things. The one of those skills, the more you practice those skills, the better you can get at them. So what are we going to do here? We're just going to add uh, a Y plus B Y minus our two kips per foot uh, times 10 feet. And that's going to equal zero. So a y, right? What's what's the two times ten? Um, that's just twenty. So it's the difference here. It's going to be a y is going to equal fifteen kips. Okay. So we have our reactions. Let's go to our shear moment diagram again. I'll move my, my little mouse out of the way there. But what do we have? So I like to whenever I'm drawing shear moment diagrams, I like to drop these vertical lines 
kind of like points of interest, right? These are the points where we, we're going to be calculating a couple different things. So um, this is this is somewhat helpful, I think. But what we're going to do here is we're going to start and actually let me draw one to the side as well. Uh, I'll go from here. Why not? And our moment's going to do something like this. So I, I can label these, you know, shear and moment. But again, shear, all that we're going to do is, you know, you can integrate things and do calculus, but in the FE, you don't want to take the time to write out equations and solve for constants, right? What you want to do is you want to save your time, and basically you're just going to follow the loads. So for, for you know, in general, for shear and moment, you're going to, well, actually, let's start here. Uh, well, for, for shear, I'm just going to use a different color if I'm going to start over. So let's say this. For shear, basically what you do is you follow the vertical loads, right? So what does that look like? Well, that looks like here, we're gonna go up a Y to point of 15, right? So I'm gonna basically go up, and then this uniform load is gonna take me down 20, but it takes me down essentially two kips per foot. So over that 10 feet, it's gonna bring me down 20 to you know this minus five value, but because it's uniformly distributed, it's going to drop at an angle, right? You integrate a horizontal line, you get a slope line, right? So you integrate this, 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 uh, you, this, this load here, you, you get a linear relationship, right? So what does that look like a after that, right? Then we just follow the vertical loads. There's no more vertical loads over here, so we're just going to go straight over uh, to B, okay? And we didn't have to write any equations out here. We just solved for this shear diagram. And what you, again, what, what you can see with the shear diagram is for the moment, uh, what you're typically looking for is you're looking for typically, and not always, but typically, you're typically looking for places where the shear crosses, you know, zero or equals to zero. Why do we care about those points? We care about these points right here because those are the points of maximum, right? So if we integrate that line, we get a parabolic, and that's gonna give us a maximum of our moment. All right, so this is, so, so basically what we see here is we can expect a shear diagram, right, that has a maximum kind of at this, this point here. Or I'm sorry, we can expect a moment diagram. I said that wrong. We can expect a moment diagram we're going to maximum at this point. So we're going to, we're going to climb up here. Sorry, let me look at that. And, and that's going to be our maximum. So we're going to have this parabolic function that kind of comes up and over until we hit this line. And then it's going to come straight back down, right? Because, and I, and I used to say this to some of my students, um, one of whom said like, Mattson, you said that so many times and I have no clue what you mean, but, but what? I'll write it down even. The height of the shear, the height of the shear is equal to the slope of the moment. And why is that helpful? It's helpful because it helps us to identify one, you, you know, if we have this, if we have this point again, if we have this point here of zero shear, that means we're going to have this slope of zero moment. In other words, that's going to be a maximum point or a minimum point. Okay, um, if we have an increase, a positive shear, we're gonna have an increasing slope. If we have a negative shear, we're gonna have a negative slope, right? So this kind of frames our diagram. But what it also tells us is with this particular problem, the biggest thing that we have to do now is we just have to solve for what? One area. We just have to solve for this area because we already know where our maximum is. We don't have to draw the whole diagram. We just have to solve really for area one. So how do we do it? Well, what we need to do is we really need to solve for the area of that triangle, right? We're just integrating this area. We need to solve for the area of that triangle and the area of a triangle is just equal to one half the shear times some X distance. What's the X distance? What's this distance here, right? What's this X value? Well, the other thing that we know is this slope here, we just said for every one foot you go over, you drop two kips. So that informs us what X is, right? So that means that X is going to equal basically 15 kips divided by two kips per foot, or it's gonna equal 7.5 feet. And honestly, that makes a little bit of sense, right? Because if we go from, what, 15 uh, down to five, right, that you can see kind of that three-quarter ratio of, of 10 in there. 
right? So it makes a little bit of sense, but, but basically all it does here is it tells us and it informs us what our area one is going to equal. It's gonna equal one half of 15 kips times 7.5 feet, which is gonna equal 0.5 times 15 times 7.5 in my calculator comes out to 56 and a quarter uh, kip feet. Okay, which is gonna be our answer. Okay, that's gonna be our answer. And I could go through here and if I was on a test or something, not like the FE test, like I'm drawn shear moment diagrams test, what I would do is I would finish this out. I would go and calculate these other negative areas. And you should come back all the way down to point zero or, or to zero moment, uh, you know, when you're all said and done. Like, in, in other words, if I were to calculate some other areas here and call like this area, area two, and this area, area three, what should happen is area one brings us up to this point, area two brings us down to this point, and then area three brings us back to zero. So area one should equal area two plus area three if we, if we look at this, if that makes some sense. Does that make a little bit of sense? So would that work for triangular loading? That's a good question. No, for triangular loadings, you need to integrate. And honestly, I could be wrong, but I think that's gonna be, above what is going to be asked for in the FE. That's just my personal opinion. I could be completely wrong on that. Um, would, it, would integrating manually by just finding areas work for triangular loading? Not exactly because your shear would then go to a triangular loading would give a parabolic shear, which you would want to integrate to get your moment. So that gets a little bit more complicated. All right. For this one though, I think I think we're good. And I, I honestly, I think this is probably the most complicated it would get where you have some just uniformly distributed load. Yeah, and that's true. There are some tables in the reference handbook. Uh, not a ton of them. Um, so there are more beam diagrams than some of the other references. So there, there aren't a ton, but um, I would, you know, if, if we're gonna get into triangular loads, I would go look in the reference handbook a little bit more. But I think for most of what you're doing with your moment diagrams, this is probably gonna work. Just the manual approach, you solve reactions quickly, kind of integrate areas. In other words, you just find areas of triangle, one half base times height, or base times height for a rectangle, you know, and it should get you pretty close. All right, well, let's keep going here. We got a long night ahead of us. It's not a super long night, but it's, an, it's, a, it's a long session. This is one of my favorite sessions because there's so much good stuff to cover, okay? Um, more shear and moment diagrams, but this looks similar to what we just did, right? We have a couple areas here, and again, I, I sort of skipped over the problem, but what do we have? We have a shear force diagram, so we know this is a shear force diagram. Again, you gotta read the question. So this is shear and kips, distances are measured in feet, no concentrated moments are applied at the end of the beam. That's important because it tells us that we start and end at zero. Okay, essentially the beams are gonna end it's zero, they're gonna start and end at zero. We're not gonna have any big jumps in our moment diagram. Sections rectangular, again, that's given there just so that you know that the bending stress is gonna be uh, the, the maximum based on the maximum magnitude, whether it's positive or negative. So what does this look like? The magnitude of the moment that causes maximum bending stress in the beam is most nearly, all we have to do is we have to find the maximum moment. So what we learned before is, what, with the points where the shear crosses zero is are going to be the points where we have some maximums, right? So we can identify those points. And this is one of those examples where it helps you to take a step back and you don't have to find all the areas, right? The only two areas that we really need to find are this one triangle and this one rectangle, right? So I'm just gonna label those like A1. Oh, oops, let me get the right color here. I'm gonna label those A1 and A2, and hopefully we can solve these just, just as easily as we did before, right? But when we go to A1, we didn't even have to do reactions here. I mean, this is great. So when you go to A1, we just know it's, we, we just learned this, one half V times X, right? So we already know our shear V, we know this distance X, but we don't know this distance X. Wait a minute, they don't give us this distance X, and furthermore, they don't give us this slope. So what do we do? Oh man, now it gets harder, right? So what we have to do is we either have to go find this slope, one kip per how many, you know, per W, like what's our, what's our uniform load? So we can find that slope or we can use similar triangles and you kind of use this idea that, well, we have one triangle and we have a bigger triangle here, right? 
So what do we know? Well, the, the, the small triangle has what? 14 over X, right? That's our, our green triangle. Our blue triangle is what? 18 over 12 feet, 18 kips over 12 feet, right? So this is a relationship we can use, right? I mean, this is just using similar triangles, but it's it's kind of nice because now we know like we have this distance kind of sort of we can rearrange this and I'm just going to use the, I'm just going to write it like this. I'm going to say X equals what I'm going to flip everything. So I'm going to get 12 over 18 and then multiply that by 14. I think I did that right. Let's check. X is going to equal what's two thirds 12 over 18 of 14 is going to be 9.33. Does that make a little bit of sense? I think it does, right? I, I mean, I think like if this is 12, 9.3 logically makes some sense to get 9.33 out this far, right? So 9.33, that seems about right, okay? Just, just graphically like using common sense here as well. So what does that mean? So what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna find our area, right? So our area is gonna equal one half of 14 kips times what 9.33 feet and area one is what 0. 0.5 times 9.33 9 uh times or times 14 times 9.33 and we get like 65.3 kip feet so that would make you want to just say let's go with it but let's just check i mean don't don't throw everything in because maybe a2 is bigger it doesn't look bigger but let's go calculate it anyway a2 it's an easy calc here uh, what what height is that? Well, this height here is eight feet. Our distance is four feet. So that makes it a little bit easier to do. We just have a height of eight kips times four feet, and that's going to give us our 32 kip feet. Okay. So good news is we're able to make that work. And if I circle the right answer, that would be helpful. Um, 32 kip feet is the is is the mag is the moment. Uh, you know, at this point, but the, the correct answer is the 65. That's going to give us our biggest uh, bending stress for a rectangular section. That makes sense? <sighs> Hopefully that's good. Okay. We're on question three. I mean, we're, we got, what, 14 questions to go, but we got there, not 14 questions to go, 14 questions total. Some will be a little quick, bit, quick, bit quicker. Uh, some will take a little bit longer, but shear moment diagrams, again, some of these basic ideas where if you can if you can kind of understand how you're integrating areas and break it down into simple steps it's going to make it a lot easier as you go along and solve the problems on the fe it's just going to be quicker okay it's going to be quicker so let's keep coming down here Ooh, and now we get to one of these questions where i got to make my screen a little bit bigger here but Okay, let's back up. Now we have a question, and, and these questions show up on the fe we're given basically a, a load diagram and it, you're told, well, this corresponds with what? It corresponds with which moment diagram? And hopefully you know one of these things isn't the same. One of these things is actually the shear diagram, but maybe, maybe you don't see that yet. So one of these things that, it, one of the things that we, we kind of need to start thinking about is, is how shear moment diagrams work, right? So when you go from sh load to shear, right? Um, if you don't have a change in force, you don't have a change in shear. The, shear. the shear just keeps going across. But again, when we have moments, right, anytime you see, so let me just write out some principles here. So for moment diagrams, right, if we have a concentrated force, that means a step in the shear diagram but it means a slope uh, for the moment diagram. And I should, I should put like a linear slope here, a linear slope for the moment. Okay, if we have a uniform load, that means we're gonna have a linear slope for the shear and a parabolic uh, for our moment. Okay, so, so these are just some basic kind of like principles. If you can get these into your head, that's going to help, right? Because all of a sudden we see something here. We see we have a uniform load, right? So or a, a concentrated force and we have a uniformly distributed force, okay? And we kind of have to figure out what's going to happen. So if we have, if we start with this concentrated force, right, what does that mean? It means that we're going to have 
some linear slopes here. So, so some linear portions, right? The, the, the concentrated force, it's going to give us this linear slope for our uniform load. So we kind of cut a couple here. I mean, we got, we got three of these that are, that are kind of all like picked out here. They, they all kind of have these linear portions to them. It doesn't help us too much. Um, if we go to the moment, we can say that, okay, here's our, here's our, here's, here we have some parabolic sections. This one's not parabolic. So this one's not parabolic. We can get rid of it. Uh, yeah, so comment there. We can get rid of D. Um, we can definitely get rid of D because what do we know? We, we see that um, this is not linear. You know, this is actually, I mean, in all honesty, I put this one in here because this is the actual shear diagram. Uh, for that load condition, okay. <laughs> so just to spoil it a little bit there for you, but this is the shear moment, shear diagram. So what do we have to do next? We have to figure out well which one makes sense, right? And what we see here is again, if if we think about this as we're integrating from left to right, we're adding this area, right? What you would see here is, I mean, if this is the shear diagram, right? We're going to have this relative maximum. Eh, maybe I didn't get it perfect, but we're going to have this relative maximum somewhere about where it equals to zero, where the shear equals zero, right? So we're going to have uh, we're going to have this thing going on. The other thing that's interesting about this question here is this is called a cusp, right? So this point down, you know, down here is called a cusp, and what it means is there's an instantaneous change in the slope of that moment diagram, right? An instantaneous change. And if you remember what I said before on the last problem, the height of the shear is equal to the slope of the moment, right? Height of the shear is equal to the slope of the moment. So if I, you know, I, if I tell you that this is the shear diagram down here, we have a negative, negative shear on the left side of the support. So we have this negative slope. And then when we go to the right side, all of a sudden we jump to a positive shear and we go to a positive slope. So this is kind of cool. What happens is there's this instantaneous change there's a cusp in the moment diagram. So this diagram, diagram C, is going to, to be the, the winner. So, so this is gonna be the winner. We get our, our linear sections, we get our parabolic sections, we get this cusp at the support. There's typically negative moment at the support, and that's gonna help us there. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. We'll talk a little bit more about this on the next one as well, and specifically talk about positive and negative bending. Actually, let's just, let's, let's go for it now. If we think about this thing as well, another way you can look at these diagrams is just to use some common sense. And what I mean by that is the common sense says, how does this thing, how's this thing going to, uh, how's this thing going to deform? Okay. In other words, how's it going to bend? Well, if we think about this, I mean, I could sort of assume that it's going to come down, it's going to come back up over the support and then come back. Right. Can, can you picture that deflected shape? So this is, you know, approximate. A deflected shape. Okay, and why is that helpful to us? It's helpful because you'll notice again, there's this relationship between shear moment and deflection, right? It's helpful for us because if we come back in here and say there's a point where the curvature changes, you see that? There's a point where the, in here where that, that curvature changes. It, it goes, in other words, from a positive curvature right, to a negative curvature. See that? That's going to tell us something. And what's that going to tell us? Why is that important with our shear moment diagrams? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to bring up the, the, uh, the reference handbook here for a second. And I'm in the mechanics and materials section. And I'm going to come back to bending. So this is, this is what we have here going on in, in uh, positive bending and negative bending. Okay, and what the, this is the, the sign convention that's used in the FE, in, in pretty much most places, like this is just the, the standard, the standard positive bending, positive shear, negative shear uh, type of sign, internal sign convention. It's the one I use when I'm teaching, and it's the one that is pretty, pretty common. So if we come back here, what does this mean? I mean, like the, the thing that we can think about here is, is when we have positive bending, right? When we have positive bending, we can sort of figure the shape is doing something like this. And why is that important? It, because what you can see here, and hopefully you can see this, it, it's, it's a little hard to see, but this is getting longer, and this is getting shorter, right? So when you have the beam, you have these competing things going on. One's getting longer, one's getting shorter. In, in bending, this is, this is particularly what's happening. So in other words, what we know here 
is on the top where you have compression and on the bottom right we have tension okay so this is tension on the bottom and that's considered positive bending and how do you remember positive bending one of the ways that i remember is positive bending is just he's a happy guy okay positive bending pretty happy but what that also cues us into when we're looking at shear moment diagrams why do you care why do you care why do you care why do you care how is this going to help me on the fe look 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 you just by looking at this thing you can kind of just like look at a deflected shape right you can kind of just picture a deflected shape there you go i love it smiley face sad face this 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 smiley face on the right means we're going to start with positive bending here so if we if we immediately if we see that we can cancel out like this over here where we go to negative bending it's just not going to happen you see that it, it helps us when we're looking at these um in addition what it shows us here is we have this kind of inflection point right kind of near the support we would expect an inflection point where right near the support which is also what we get in this diagram okay so there's a lot of things going on here uh, but again if, if we take this and, and just draw this again for negative bending right just like yeah the the, uh, the smiley face emojis going on there uh this is this is similar right we get we get we get it to change here where now we have tension on the top uh compression on the bottom and this guy is just sad okay i'm just saying they're sad because they're just always so negative so always be positive and life will just be better but but no not not exactly but i mean like seriously like this is one way to to remember uh positive and negative bending it's one way to use it to your advantage when you're looking at questions like this i, I just talked with somebody who took the fe and they were saying i saw a question that they gave me you know, a bunch of diagrams i had to pick the, the correct moment diagram you know so this type of question does certainly show up all right so let's go to the next one and you'll use this stuff for the next one right you'll use this stuff for the next one i hope okay so the next one same type of thing shape of the moment diagram corresponding with the beam and applied load shown below is most nearly or most nearly matches right so this is just a, another take on what this what this diagram looks like or, or what this uh moment you know what what our moment diagram looks like okay so here Oh man, what is this going to look like? We're going to have a diagram with a cut off little, you know, arrow, but that's okay. I'll fix it. What is this going to look like? Well, can you picture it? Um, if we draw the free body diagram of this thing, what does this look like? We're going to have uh, our force coming down. We're going to have our uniform load here. Can, can you picture this? What are we going to have? We're going to have some support here and we're going to have some moment that has to hold that thing up. And we can go ahead and we can solve for our, our our force and our moment here, but we don't really need to. I mean, like what we could see as well is if we start to draw our shear and moment diagrams, right? We could we don't even need the numbers so much to draw these, right? We don't need them, but they can be useful. But we don't have them, so we can't use them. What we know is we're going to start going up. We're going to slope down at some level because of that uniform load. Remember, uniform load causes a sloped shear diagram. And then our shear is going to come straight over until we hit this point. Then it will come straight down, right? So this is going to be our, our shear diagram, right? So, so right away, uh, I did this on both of them, but the A goes out because that's our shear diagram which ultimately tells us you know where our moment diagram is but let's go figure it out because we have two moment diagrams that look really similar actually all three of these look kind of similar and they're all they're all a little bit different but one's right one's wrong yeah sure looks like a hey, beautiful so so what are we going to do here we are going to go and we're going to solve this so, so the question is we have a free let's start here we have a free end what's the moment at a free end if there's no applied moment at that free end the moment has to be zero right so the moment at this end has to be zero so we only have two options left and i would love to do a poll right now but it, oh man we only have two options left we have b and we have c so which one is it i mean we have a positive shear the shear is kind of happy over here does that mean we have a positive moment and the answer is no why is the answer no the answer is going to be negative moment why is this negative moment let's think about deflected shape again this thing's going to want to deflect like this 
Can you, can you picture that? What does that mean? It's going to put tension on the top and compression on the bottom. And that is our negative moment, right? So that's going to be our negative moment. Our negative moment is going to say a uh, tension on the top and compression on the bottom. The negative moment is going to have tension on the top, compression on the bottom. Uh, a lot of times the way I'll draw it is I'll, I'll draw it like this. I'll say positive is like this, negative is like this. And you'll notice here as well, if you draw this in, this is, this is the sign convention that I teach my students. It's just this is positive bending on the left, negative bending on the right. And the reason that's nice to draw sometimes is because if you have that, now you can take a look and say, okay, this, this free body diagram, I drew it like that. I drew the moment like that. And it matches over here, right? What does that mean? It means we're, we're kind of like pulling away on the top and we're what? We're pushing towards on the bottom. Can you picture that? That's what that moment means. It, it, it means we're pulling away on the top, pushing towards on the bottom. So we end up with tension on the top, uh, compression on the bottom. That's going to be our negative ending. So that leads us to eliminating this guy because this is a positive moment. And, and maybe I should have, you know, on this diagram said this is positive, this is negative, you know, uh, and this is negative, this is negative. I, I probably could have done that, but this is where we're going with this. I, I mean, and it's, it's interesting. Some different, some structural engineering software programs I've used will flip the moment diagram just because it's useful that some that way sometimes for for understanding like where to put reinforcing and concrete beams that sort of thing but for here we kind of get have to get that understanding of positive moment versus negative moment and make it work okay the positive moment negative moment it kind of a, a a big deal when it comes to understanding tension compression and how to solve these problems right because two you know in this question right we had two solutions that looked really 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 pretty good uh, but at the end of the day, one of them's wrong, one of them's right, and the right one is going to be D because that puts us at a negative moment. It has this, it has our our what our parabolic shape, where we have this uniform load, and then it has kind of this uh, this linear this linear portion where we we have no load and it brings down to zero. All right, so hopefully positive and negative moment are making a little bit more sense. It's one of those things that I, I hit on a ton when I teach a structural an analysis course because it's it's super important when we get to like concrete analysis and design, for example, because you need to know where to put the rebar, right? And if we were looking at this thing, like if this was a cantilever beam that we're designing for uh, for for concrete, right? What we'd want is we'd know that this beam is uh, is up here, right? And we have some big load on it, but we have like if this is a concrete beam, we're gonna have some moment on here, so we're gonna have some tension at the top, some compression at the bottom. We'd really, 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 really want to make sure we get our reinforcing up at the top to resist that tension. If we're doing concrete, don't worry, we'll do concrete in a couple of weeks, and and that'll be fun too. Uh, if if you think this is fun, I think it's fun. So I mean, we'll just keep going. Okay, so negative moment versus positive moment is something to think about and hopefully make sense of it. Okay. Let's keep going because we got a lot to do. Uh, this question I added into the review this year. I thought it was a great question. Uh, I, I was asking, you know, talking to people that had taken the test. They said there was something similar, you know, I, and again, I'm, I'm not getting uh, questions exactly from anybody, but it's, it's just the idea of stress strain, elongation. And the one that I thought, the, the thing that I thought was interesting about this question in particular was the idea that here we have a question and we're given a beam. Okay, so let's read it. And so we, we have a following beam supported by two steel cables, so A and B, and, and we're just not going to worry that we don't have any like horizontal load here. Don't worry, it's, it's, it's not stable, but we'll, we'll deal with it. Okay, so it's supported by these, these, these cables. And they have modulus elasticity to 29,000. If you remember what that is, that's the kind of the spring constant of, of steel cross-sectional area, 0.1 square feet. Um, in addition to supporting the applied load, the weight of the beam is 200 pounds. So, so here we're specifically given a beam weight, so we have to deal with it, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that beam weight, we're gonna take a look at it, and we're gonna go and what did we do the first couple of problems? Do you remember? We solved reactions. So, so basically what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say, okay, we got some force AY, uh, we got some force BY, if you wanted to, you could just sum moments about B and get AY directly. Uh, personally, I, I don't find it like too much 
crazier just to some moments about a and subtract so you can do it either way uh i kind of like always some moments about point a just because it's consistent and that way i don't screw people up when i'm when i'm teaching it but but what we do here is we have a y um a y doesn't cause a moment about a but let's some moments about point a uh equals zero again you got to get these reactions down to one to two minutes what do we have we have 800 pounds uh times four feet it's gonna be minus then we have minus 200 pounds times what's our distance there well this whole distance what's our whole distance our whole distance is uh 16 feet so that means our 200 is going to act at half of that or eight feet and then i'm going to add in by times that 16 feet that's all going to have to equal zero so i can solve for by and this isn't too crazy in terms of math but 800 times 4 plus 200 uh, times 8 and that gives us like 4800 divided by 16 and i get 300 pounds for by okay so by hopefully works then what do we want to do some of the force in the y direction equals zero and this one i'm going to say well a y plus b y equals zero and maybe on the fe you don't even write this out you just say well okay we got 800 and 200 going down we got 300 going up we need another what 700 going up right uh, a y plus b y doesn't equal zero a y plus b y minus 800 uh, minus 200 uh, equals zero so you should be able to get a y equals what 700 pounds okay so now we start thinking okay 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 what did the question ask for we did our we did our reactions but we have to find the strain in the cable does anybody remember what strain is <laughs> it's one of those things that um you calculate when you get into like concrete design a bunch you, you have the 0.02s and 0.03s and maybe you took a concrete design course and you remember those 0.02s and 0.03s and you say yeah it's a good number we're just going to use it but don't do that okay um just just bear with me here for a second let's go back to our reference handbook and look at look things up a little bit so if i come back here we have hooks law i'm gonna come back another page here maybe another couple of pages uh where do we go to here we go here we go we have uniaxial load and deformation so we, we have a couple of equations we have the stress equals the force over area right the stress we also have this uh this 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 um this this epsilon here which is called delta over l this the the, the interesting thing here is i i don't see even right in here where this this epsilon is called out as strain that's a, that's a little annoying because you might go to the fe reference handbook and do a quick well i'm just gonna find strain right uh and, and do a search here and when i do that i get a whole bunch of of equations i get What's this? I, there's nothing even here. Minus lateral strain over longitudinal strain. I mean, that's the Poisson ratio, but uh, where else? I, I mean, if I keep going, I get stresses and strain, you get shear strain, and you see we're just getting further and further away. You do see down here that this is an epsilon as a normal strain, but it starts taking us further and further away from the equation that we actually want, which is going to be this E equals uh, sigma over epsilon. Okay, so the way that I think of that equation is is typically the, the way that I typically think of that equation is uh, stress equals epsilon times e where this epsilon is our our strain so this is one of those basic formulas that like uh, is fundamental to engineering right so yeah so so the modulus elasticity is the stress uh, divided by the strain Okay, so so we could we could flip this around and we can say the strain is equal to what equal to sigma over e over uh, over e and and is that what we we're given? No, here we're given e equals sigma divided by epsilon. Did I do that wrong or something? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean sigma divided by epsilon makes sense, but what we're trying to find is epsilon. We're trying to find the strain. Okay. So the good news is we're given E, we're given this modulus elasticity, we're given 29,000. All we really need to do here is now we need to find sigma, which we, we saw up above, uh, that sigma equals P over A. So here, let's do P over A. What do we have? We have 700 pounds, divided by 0 0.1 square feet. So what's that? It's, that's going to be 7,000 pounds per square foot okay so so we're just golden right so all we have to do here is seven thousand 
pounds per square foot divided by our 29,000 and we're good, right? If only it was that easy. You know, yeah, if, it was, if only it was that easy. Yeah, uh, it, it's not. So I'm just going to write kips per square inch. And some of you are wondering, why isn't it that easy? And like getting a, ah, like you can do this. Don't worry. You can solve this problem. And this is just Hooke's Law, but sometimes it gets annoying because the units are annoying. So you'll notice that we have kips on the bottom and pounds on the top. So we have to reconcile that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this thing times one kip per 1,000 pounds. Unit conversions are a big deal. You got to know those unit conversions, especially in strength of materials, because this is going to it's going to come up all the time. So our kips will cancel out our, our I'm sorry, I, I crossed the wrong thing out. Our, our pounds will cancel out here uh, and we'll, we're going to be left with kips. And then the other thing that I want to do here is I want to take and multiply times for every one square foot. I'm going to have 144 square inches. My square feet will cancel out. And what you actually, my kips will cancel out. My inches squared will cancel out. And the nice thing is everything cancels out because strain is really inch per inch. It, it's, it's unitless. It's just a measure of, uh, of, of like length per length. So this is going to give us our answer. And now when we get our answer, if, if you stopped at 7,000 divided by 29,000, you would have, you would have come up with closer to this value. But if we divide by a thousand and we divide by the 144, um, we're going to get like point zeros. I mean, we're going to get this two times. It's like it's it ends up being like 1.67 or 68 times 10 to the minus six is, is kind of the strain there. So we're going to end up with this value down here, which is a, a small value. That's a really small number, but that's the strain. OK, and there's there's you know anytime you see something like this where you get a whole bunch of essentially order of magnitude difference be on the lookout for units because units can play a huge role in this and um, take you from the wrong answer all the way to the right answer okay so i i mean honestly you need these conversions in here you need uh, these unit conversions in order to get the right answer so yeah i mean stress equals epsilon times times e you know this is just like in the comments there this is kind of the f equals kx except we're we're kind of in 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 normalized terms so stress is normalized by area strain is normalized by the original length and um the other thing that that uh, is interesting about this problem uh, honestly is is normally when i think of strain uh, honestly a lot of times when i think of strain there's another equation in the reference handbook so if we come back to the reference handbook uh it, if we look at strain there's this equation down here which is just delta over l it's just the the change in length over the original length but what do we see about this problem here we're not even given a length right so we don't even have a length there this length is unknown and that's okay we don't need to know that length to get the strain it, it's an it's a it's kind of a normalized value but it's something to think about because because one of these fundamental equations f equals kx is sigma equals you know epsilon times e. This is kind of that 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 fundamental stress strain equation that I think could, could show up as well. All right. So hopefully this question made some sense and we did all the unit conversions right. Okay. So let's keep going to the next next question. My question seven. We're rocking and rolling here. So. What do we got? We got, I like this question too. I like all these questions, but I'm just biased. So what do we got? We got a clevis. Okay. And uh, honestly, I think I did this question in my notes and I got it wrong because <laughs> I forgot something and, and it's so easy to make mistakes, but let's draw a free body diagram here and let's draw a free body diagram of this clevis here. And what we're going to do is we say we have a clevis used to connect a steel bracket. So this is a bracket to a block of wood. We have a force of, you know, 15, kilonewtons right 15 kilonewtons and what else do we have we have kind of these 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 nuts on either side and then, and then we're going to cut the bolt and when we cut the bolt and take that piece of wood out we have to replace that piece of wood with a force or, or we have to re replace that cut bolt with a force so this is going to be kind of like p over two and p over two do you see it so the question is is so if that's what we have and we have a force of p this bolt has a diameter of 20 uh, 20 millimeters, right? So this is what 20 millimeters. 
the average shear stress in the bolt along line A, so at this point here, right? So at this point along line A is going to be what? So basically, we're just looking for the average stress along one of the bolts. What is it? Well, again, if we come back to our reference handbook, hopefully, honestly, if you get a question like this, I hope that you don't really need to go there because if you get to shear stress, there's there's some crazy formulas and they're kind of crazy and they they get challenging sometimes to uh, implement. But where where did it even go? Let me let me zoom out here so I can see. Uh, what do we have? We have shear stress and strain. We get this G. We all sorts of things in here. Okay. Oops. Did I go buy it? Uh, where's the VQ over IT formula? It's in here somewhere. Here's torsional strain. Here's a, a phi, a T. We'll come back to those later. Uh, honestly, it's in here somewhere. I don't even know where because I, 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 I'm not looking to use it. Um, honestly, what I'm looking to do is, is I'm actually looking for another value here of oops where am i making, where am i going here okay so what i'm looking for is a, a a sheer stress but i'm not looking for for this so much what i'm looking for honestly is just if i'm if i'm looking for an average shear stress uh typically an average shear stress is just equal to the force over the area okay so, so again, average shear stress, we're not looking for stress concentrations. We're not looking at the maximum shear stress. Did you find it? Page 130. So let, let me look at the so page 130. Oh, that's what you were telling me. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe. See, I thought I thought, I thought I remember seeing in the, the handbook VQ over IT somewhere. And that's probably in here somewhere. And you can find it. Honestly, I don't think there's going to be a question on, uh, on VQ over IT just because it takes too long to do. We have torsional shear stress. Uh, we have a couple other things going on, but uh, I, I, no, there's the there's there it is the transverse shear flow, right? Um, but typically, here's our VQ over IB. But for what we're doing, really, we're not looking at a stress in a beam. We're just looking at an average shear stress in a bolt. Okay, a little bit a little bit different. And what we're looking at here is well, I'm just going to write it down here. It's just going to be equal to what we were our force, which is essentially here p over two uh, divided by our area of our bolt, which is going to be pi times the diameter of you know pi times let's say the radius of uh, radius squared. So this is this is essentially we get the force on the bolt, and this is the area of the bolt. Okay, so that's it. I mean, I mean, really, that's 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 this problem. But let's take a look. So we have fifteen kilonewtons times or, or divided by two um, divided by pi times what's our our diameter? Well, our radius. If our diameter is twenty, our radius is going to be ten millimeters squared. And again, we get into units here. So does anybody remember what a megapascal is? Uh huh. The unfortunate thing is, or the, the kind of crazy thing is, if we go to our reference handbook again, and you're not sure what a megapascal is, you can come to units and conversions, right? And you know that mega is 10 to the 6, which is nice. But what's a pascal? I mean, if we come down to pascal, we get a pascal as an atmosphere, or it's 1 newton per meter squared. Honestly, I think this is one of those conversions that is probably worth committing to memory for the strength of materials part. One megapascal equals what? It equals um, one newton per millimeter squared, or it equals uh, a, a kilonewton. Uh, I'm sorry, a thousand kilonewtons per meter squared. So, so these are. This is one of those sets of conversions. <laughs> That you're going to want to know. Uh, I, I, honestly, it's just one of those conversions that is going to be helpful as you go through uh, this process. Uh, just to, to be honest with you, this is going to help you. It, it's one of those conversions. But what we see here is on the top, we have kilonewtons, right? On the bottom, we have millimeters. So I'm going to convert those. And personally, I'm going to pick this first one. Sometimes I'll pick this one. Sometimes I'll pick this one. But if you know both, it's going to, it's going to be helpful to you. And if I come in here with my unit conversions, I'm going to multiply by 1,000. A newtons per kilonewton, right? So we end up with newtons per millimeter squared. That's going to give us uh, that's going to give us our, our megapascals, right? So if we do this, I think fifteen over two, fifteen over two times a thousand. What's that? Seventy-five hundred divided by 
uh, pi divided by 100 gets us to about 23.9 uh, megapascals. So that's sufficiently close, and it should get us the right answer. Now, if you didn't, if you didn't, if you didn't divide this by two, you would get the wrong answer, which I got when I was doing my notes. Uh, but you'd get the wrong answer if you forget to divide it by two. You get the forty-eight, which is incorrect. Okay, just something to think about, something to take take uh, take consideration of. All right, let's keep moving. Okay, uh, again, maximum torsional shear stress. So we were just looking through the reference handbook, but now we asked, we're asked for a maximum torsional shear stress, 10 centimeter diameter solid steel shaft subject to an applied torque of 50 kilonewton meters. So let's take a look back at the reference handbook. Uh, we'll come back to our mechanics and materials section. And again, one of the reasons I like showing this to you is just so that you can get used to using it as well, how to navigate it. Uh, you know, we could type in torsion here. Uh, but we could also, if we know it's in the mechanics and materials section, we should be able to find it pretty quickly, right? So we have some torsional strain. We also have torsional torsion stress, right? So here it's not torsional, it's torsion. So if you're searching for torsional, like with the AL, uh, it might not show up. So, so just uh, you got to be careful when you're searching to make sure that you get the right answer. So what we have here is tau or the, the, the shear stress is equal to TR over J. This is for solid or thick walled uh, shaft. So here we have a solid shaft. We just have a solid shaft, so we can use it. So we get tau equals TR over J. So let me just write that down. And, and the good news is when you're doing your test, you're gonna have the, the uh, reference handbook on one side and your test on the other side. So you won't have to be flipping back and forth like I am. But T, what was it, TR over J? Sometimes they use the letter C. So Regardless, what we know is we have to find the torque, right? And that is, there, our torque, we're, we're told, is 50 kilonewton meters. We got that. R is the radius, and J is the, what, the polar uh, moment of inertia. Okay, so we have all those pieces that we can figure out. The good news is we know the torque already. We're we're just we're given the torque. We're told the torque is equal to what fifty kilonewton meters. Okay, we're told the the diameter is equal to ten centimeters, and I'm just going to convert that on the fly. But what's ten centimeters? Ten centimeters is what a tenth of a meter or hundred millimeters. You can do it either way. This this time I'm going to use kilonewtons and meters. So the radius equals what zero point zero five meters. Okay, and now we need this J term. What's J? Well, if we come back to our reference handbook here, J is the polar moment of inertia, and we would love it if they would just give us a formula for J right here. But they don't. Okay, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's the way it is. I mean, it'd be, this is where you use it, right? But it's, you kind of have to start searching through here and, and hope you find a, a, you know, find something. But you, we get down to thermodynamics and we didn't find it. It's kind of a, a little bit of annoying or annoyance. But what you remember from the static section is that's where we looked at moment of inertia. So statics is moment of inertia. So if we come back down here, we get to our circle. And the good news is the circle gives us J as, the polar moment of inertia, it doesn't tell us it's the polar moment of inertia, but we know that J is what we're looking for. We got pi times A, which is the radius of the fourth over two. So J is pi times A to the four over two, or we could say pi times R to the four over two. So now we can just plug in chug, right? So now we can just say tau equals to T, so 50 kilonewton meters times our radius of uh, 0 0.05 meters divided by uh, pi times our radius of 0 0.05 meters to the fourth all over two. And if we do that out, uh, I, I think we're gonna get some value here. Let's, we'll get some value, <laughs> hopefully get the right value. Let's see, 50 times 0 0.05 uh, divided by pi, divided by 0 0.05 to the fourth, and then what I like to do is I like to multiply by the two rather than put it in parentheses. But um, I get like, the, what do I get? I get like 250, 50, you know, five, zero, zero, zero. And this is gonna be kilonewtons. What are our units left? Kilonewtons per meter squared. 
right? So if you remember, uh, our conversion here is, is going to be times 1 megapascal per 1,000 kilonewtons per meter squared. So that's a good thing because our three zeros cancel out and we are left with a solution that looks like it should work. All right, so I hope that's good. But again, those, those unit conversions are huge in this. Um, knowing where to find some of this stuff is huge. Uh, the polar moment inertia, you can't just search for polar moment inertia. You can't just search for J, right? You kind of have to know where it is in the manual or just commit this equation to memory. But I honestly, I'd, I'd go look it up. I just know you, you kind of have to remember where it is in the sense that it's in the static section. So the static section has those moments of inertia. They're there. You can go look them up and hopefully you can find it when you need it. Okay. So let's keep going here. And let's keep going to question number nine. And I tried to put these two torsion ones together just because once you find A once, you kind of need, need it a second time. But let's look at the maximum angle of twist developed in a four meter long aluminum shaft with a diameter of 12 centimeters when subjected to a torque of 50 kilonewton meters is most nearly. So let's go back and find our, our, our uh, formula for twist. And again, if we come into our reference handbook, and take a look at this thing here. We're just going to come back down until we go to, well, actually, let's go to mechanics and materials. And if you remember, we had our, our uh, torsional, uh, torsional stress here, torsional strain. Uh, we also have this phi thing going on here, down here. And, and phi is going to be the strain. So, so this is going to be the strain in the shaft. So phi is going to be essentially equal to TL over GJ. And one of the unfortunate things about the reference handbook here is it sort of misses the you know you, you have to you have to skip pages here um unless you're looking at a continuous in in a, a, the your pdf viewer you have phi equals the total angle radians of twist t is the torque l is the length of the shaft so we can come back here uh we can write our formula down right so t equals tl over j sorry i wrote that wrong phi um equals tl over jg so phi equals TL over JG. Phi is what we're looking for, so we just get the plug and chug, right? So phi equals T, which is 50 kilonewton meters, times L, which is what? We have four meters long, divided by J. If you remember, J was pi times the radius. So, so I'm just going to write this down. J is equal to pi times the radius to the fourth over two. So what's that? Our radius is going to, if we have a diameter of... 12 centimeters, that's going to be 0 0.12 meters, or, uh, or, or, or what? It's going to be 0 0.06 meters is going to be our radius, right? Diameter over 2 gives us a radius. So 0 0.06 meters to the fourth, all over 2. And G, what's G whiz? Uh, so G, let's go look up G. G, G, they don't give us here. In, in the past problem, we gave we were given a modulus of elasticity, right? G is the modulus of rigidity. So this is the modulus of rigidity. And one of the reasons, I think I spelled that right, rigidity. Uh, one of the reasons I put this one in here like this is because I wanted to show you that in this, in your mechanics and materials section, if you go far enough, you eventually hit a table here. Oops, that's not what I was looking for. We get a table here where we are given some material properties. And these are, you know, the, standard material properties that you can go and find. So what we have is for, I, I think this was aluminum, right? It was, did we have aluminum? We had uh, an aluminum shaft. So we have an aluminum shaft. We have our modulus of rigidity. That's 26 gigapascals, 26 gigapascals. Okay, so I'm gonna come back here. I know that G, I'll just write it down here. G equals 26 uh, gigapascals. I mean, six looks like a little bit like a zero. I'm going to fix that here. So 26 gigapascals, which equals 26,000 megapascals. Okay. And again, if, if we're dealing with unit conversions here, uh, 26,000 megapascals. Uh, if, if you remember on the last problem, what did we do to go from... Now, well, one meter or one megapascal is 1,000 kilonewtons per meter squared. So I'm going to multiply by what? By uh, one kilonewton per, or I'm sorry, no, 1,000 kilonewtons per meter squared is equal to one megapascal to, to get that converted correctly. 
Again, these unit conversions are huge, especially when we get to strength of materials. So, oh man, this this gets. Let's just check our units here. We get kill newtons drop out. We get uh, what do we get? We have mega pascals they drop out. Uh, we have. Uh, what am I missing? Well, so we have a meter on the top, a meter on the top that takes out our meter squared. Right? No. The, oh, I'm sorry. That, that doesn't take out our meter squared. Our meter on the top, meter on the top. So this meter, this meter, and these two square meters knock out all of our meters down here. So, so our units do work out, and we are left with some value here. Let's see what we get. 50 times 4 divided by pi divided by 0.06 to the 4th. Okay, divided by 26,000, um, divided by another 1,000 times 2. So I get a value of 0 0.378. And you think, man, I've already spent four minutes on this problem, so I need to keep moving, but don't pick A. Is that okay? You might be thinking, Madsen, what'd you do? What'd you do? Why is that wrong? But don't, don't worry. If we come back here, maybe somebody knows. All right it's in the comments here right but what what do we get this this value here uh gives us yeah can i get down here again uh where did it go where did it go T phi is what it's the total angle in radians of twist <laughs> so uh, i like to think of it it's it's the angle of twist with a twist Right, there's a twist at the end. You have to understand that this is in, this is in, those units are huge. This is in radians, right? So to go from radians to uh, degrees, we have to multiply by 180 over pi. And when we do that, we get about 22 degrees. So not exactly, it's like 21 something, but it's like, oh man, angle of twist with a twist. Just remember that that twist, you gotta always, you gotta always convert, you know, you gotta convert, convert from radians. Of two degrees. Okay. We only got a few questions left here. I mean, I I, I could go all night, but uh, you don't want to. So, but no, honestly, like looking through these problems, working through them, coming coming up to reality and realizing that, oh wait, I need to know my unit conversions. I need to know what a megapascal is. I need to know what kilonewton per meter squared is. I need to know what a radian is, right? I mean, these things are helpful. If you, honestly, if you're going in the reference handbook to look up how to convert radians, it's in there. I, I, I'm not gonna lie, it's in there. So if I come down, uh, where is it? I think, I, I think it's in here somewhere, right? A radian, does it give me a radian? Uh, I thought it was somewhere. Maybe I missed it. Uh, I, I I saw it earlier. It was it shows up as pi over 180 in here somewhere. And it, but it's like if you have to go look at that. I mean I can't even find it now, right? If if you have to go find it, there it is. Radian 180 over pi. So yeah, you can go find it right there. Um, but it's just it it wastes time. So if you can commit some of these things to memory, that's going to be super 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 helpful. All right, let's keep going. Oh, another de deformation question. Yikes. Okay, deformation. This is one of those other equations that I think is important for you, right? So one of those other equations that I think is important, it's one of the ones that we harp on all the time in the strength of materials course that I teach. Uh, what we're doing is is this the basic equation is delta equals PL over AE, okay? If that comes, you can derive it from the stress and strain formula that we looked at earlier. Uh, if if we go back to our mechanics and materials section, it's in there, right? So if we come down and come down, did I just pass it? No, it's right there. Um, this is our our delta it is our elastic longitudinal deformation is equal to PL over AE. Okay, so so we have that formula. And basically, what we're given here is we're given a composite member with properties and dimensions given. The magnitude of the axial force P. So this force P, that's going to cause the total length of the member to increase by five millimeters at most nearly. So, so we already have the answer, sort of. We, we know the answer to the deformation is going to be five millimeters. So we're not finding deformation anymore. What we're going to find, though, is what that force P is. So, so really what we know here is we know that the delta total has to equal the delta for the steel bar plus the delta for the aluminum bar. That makes sense. So basically, you're just gonna add these two together and get your total deformation. And it's not too crazy. And let's just start substituting in. So we know that this five millimeters 
is gonna equal what? It's gonna equal P times what? Times L over AE for the steel plus P times L over AE for the aluminum. And you might be wondering, wait, 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 why'd you write, write the P differently? Uh, because the P is the same, right? This, this P force here for this one, it's, it's constant throughout the whole beam, right? This P is not changing whether you're in steel or you're in aluminum. You're pulling on this thing with the same force all the way throughout the beam. So this P force is constant. So basically you end up with one equation, one unknown, and we can plug and chug and try to solve this right now. So let's, let's try to solve this and see where we get to. So we get our five millimeters equals, I'm gonna actually factor this out. So P, I'm just gonna do this out kind of like, you know, kind of like this. So the length is, so, so again, now we have to think, what are we going to use for units? I, in this one, I, I'm starting with millimeters, so I'm going to use millimeters here. So 250 centimeters, what's that? That's going to be 2,500 2, millimeters, right? You multiply one centimeter equals 10 millimeters, right? Okay, so we got our 2,500 millimeters, we got our 3,000 millimeters on the top. Okay, and then what's on the bottom? Well, our bottom is our area, so 30 millimeters squared because it's rectangular and 20 millimeters squared because that's rectangular and what's e oh man they don't give it to us again they don't sorry i didn't give it to you but what what is it what's e well again we can come back in here and we can come back to our table here where again we have uh some some values for e so we have steel is is 200 gigapascals Aluminum is 69 gigapascals for E. We're not using the modulus of rigidity anymore. We're using modulus of elasticity. So we get E of, what did I say, 200? Uh, 200, that's gigapascals. So I'm going to add on three zeros to go to megapascals. Okay. And then uh, we had 69,000 megapascals over here. So this just becomes an, a, a calculator exercise. So get your calculator out. Plug in the numbers, see if you can get it. And in theory, you get a value here. Let's take a look at what value we get. So if I put this in, you get five divided by what? And I'm gonna do parentheses here. So 2,500 divided by 30 squared uh, divided by 200,000. I'm gonna add in 3,000 uh, divided by uh, 20 squared divided by 69. And I get a value here of P equals 4788. Uh, what do you think? Anybody else get that? I think he did. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. Maybe you don't know how to use your calculator. But maybe I don't know how to use my calculator. So the obvious answer, right, is going to be 40,000. Oh man, I hate units. Don't you sometimes? Uh, because what's a megapascal? What's a megapascal? A megapascal, if we remember, let's just erase megapascals for a second. If we erase megapascals for a second, we could write this in as a newton per millimeter squared. Remember that? That conversion, newton per millimeter squared. So what does that mean? That means this answer down here is not kilonewtons, it's newtons. <sighs> Units are so tricky. So what does this mean? It means for every 1,000 newtons, we have one kilonewton, and we can get uh, essentially 40, you know, 40.8 uh, uh, kilonewtons. Okay, so the right answer that I'll circle in green are 40 kilonewtons. Really, it's closer to 41, but to the nearest 10, it, it works. Okay. Oh boy. Hopefully. Hopefully you're following along with the units there and the units make sense, but the units are so important to understand and to get the right answer, especially when you get things. Again, if you ever see something like this where you get orders of magnitude difference, take a look at the units. Make sure you're doing those units correctly and just take the extra couple minutes to don't don't be like, man, I nailed this. I know what this is and I can do this and then screw up on the units and get and get it wrong. All right, let's keep going. OK, copper pipe. Thermal deformation. This is more a thermal stress problem, but I threw it in there because again, it 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 really is gonna 
r remind us of this equation that we started with stress equals what uh, strain times modulus elasticity. So, so you might be thinking, wait, why, why is that in here? This is, we're talking about thermal deformation, but we'll get there in a second. So we have a copper pipe. It has a diameter 19 millimeters. Okay, and a thickness of one, one, one millimeter. So it's, it's installed between two fixtures. So a lot of times copper gets installed between two fixtures. And basically what we're, we're going to have here is we're going to have this pipe that goes in between these two walls and it's fixed. We know that the diameter here is, what, 19 millimeters. We know the thickness is one millimeter. Uh, we know that this wall is, what, four meters apart. And, at, you know, the initial temperature, so temperature initial is going to be 20 degrees C. Uh, there's no axial stress in the pipe. So when it's first installed, it's installed, no stress, everybody's happy. But the problem is the pipes don't always uh, stay the same temperature. So here we have a temperature, we have a liquid going through it that's 5 degrees. So the temperature, you know, final is going to be 5 degrees Celsius. So we have a delta T essentially of, what, 15 degrees C. Okay, that's easy enough so far, but what we want to find is the axial stress in the pipe. Okay, so let's come back and look, look, look what we have. So if we're back in our strength of material section, right, and we come back in here, we have this composite section, stresses and beams, and we look for stresses and we see nothing of thermal stress. And you're like, uh-oh, I don't know where to go. We were back in beams, nothing there, right? But eventually, maybe you guys already found it. Uh, right, eventually, what do we get? We get, I'm going to close my search box because that's annoying. Uh, where do we go? Well, it's not there yet. Where else? There's more circle. Don't worry. The, the, the more circle will be our friend in a minute. Uh, where else do we go? I mean, we keep coming back here. Finally, we see thermal deformation. But it's deformation and it's not, it's not stress. So again, this is where the FE is going to mess with you a little bit. They're going to take these concepts that you kind of know, but maybe you're not, you start looking for thermal stress and you, can, you don't find it here, right? But you see this thermal deformation. So let's write that equation down. So delta equals alpha L, kind of delta T. So, so basically what we have is delta equals alpha L delta T. It was, you know, in the change in temperature. Uh, so, so, so remember some of those basic equations, stress equals delta over L. Uh, maybe, maybe somebody's seeing it right now, but delta and L, delta and L. What do we have? We have delta and L, right? What else do we have? We know that strain equals what? Sigma over E, right? And all of a sudden, we can sort of go back here and we can say, okay, well, delta over L equals alpha delta T, right? And if I know that, then I know that strain equals alpha delta T. And sigma over E equals alpha delta T. Am I going too fast? I don't know. But basically, I'm just substituting in, right? So first, I just divided both sides by L to get this. Then I'm going to take my, my strain relationship here, right? So I'm going to take this strain relationship and plug it in. And eventually, we get to this point where we have this equation of sigma equals what? Alpha E delta t and that's going to be our equation so it's it's one of those things where we're we're yeah we, we have to go get alpha from the table but but we also have to understand this idea that if we can get deformation we can translate that to a stress as well so we can go from stress to deformation or back and forth based on you know kind of our basic uh stress and strain equation so what do we get we get uh, sigma equals well alpha let's go look up alpha alpha for what is this copper so alpha for copper uh, we have to come back to our table here. Where's our table? It's just a couple pages down. And copper, alpha, what do I get? I get the, the, for the degree C, it's the one in parentheses here. So it's 16.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 6 per degree C. So 16.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 6 per degree C. So what's that? It's equal to 16.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 6 per degree C. So now we can just plug and chug and hopefully we get the right answer. So 16.6 times 10 to the minus 6 per degree C uh, times E. We have to come back and get E for copper. What's E for copper? So if we're at copper, we have E of 117 GPA. So E, uh, we said, was equal to 117 GPA. Gigapascals. I'll write my one a little bit better there. And... 
what else? Uh, I think that's all we need, right? So this is times 117,000 megapascals times our delta T of 15 degrees centigrade. So sigma equals, if we do that right, let's check it. So 16.6 E, uh, you know, minus 6 times 117,000. I uh, got too many zeros in there, but I think it'll work. Let's go ahead. They took one out uh, times 15, and I get about the 29 uh, megapascals, which fortunately for us is is also in the list. But the interesting thing, even with this, is you, you'll notice that the L's actually drop out. The diameter drops out. Well, this is just a ratio, essentially, of change in temperature and alpha and E. Okay. But... I thought this was kind of a cool problem because again, it, what the FE is going to try to do to you a little bit, and not and not and not to mess with you really, but what it's going to do is it's going to take some of these basic concepts of, you know, sometimes it's just going to be plug and chug, sometimes it's just going to be delta. We'll find delta, and you're just going to go look up alpha, you're going to look up alpha, you're going to look up delta t. Other times it's going to take this equation and see if you can add in, you know, your sigma epsilon e equation as well and make things work. So it's going to take the problems, take that fundamental concept. And twist it a little bit so if you can you know if you understand the basics you should be able to make it work all right we're we're getting there we got only got a few questions left let's see let's keep going here so we'll keep going oh i love this question this is like one of my favorite questions i oh, they have all of them my favorites but this this question has your place in my heart except i think the first time i did it, i did it wrong so let's just you know at least i i shouldn't do it wrong tonight so so this question uh, we have combined stresses. Principal stress is more circle. So combined stresses, right? What we have here is bracket shown in the figure below supports a force, right? So we have a force P. Uh, my favorite force tonight has been 15 kilonewtons. So 15 kilonewtons, right? And this, this cross section is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, not a crazy cross section, okay? The maximum combined stress at the base of the column point A due to force P is most nearly. So just due to force P, we're not dealing with self-weight, but what's the what's the stress down here? You remember combined stresses? I, I kind of like combined stresses. They, they take a lot of stresses. And some of you are probably thinking like, man, were we ever going to get to like bending stress? But yeah, here we are. So we have this, this, this bending. We have a, a moment at A. We have a force at A, right? And let's just start with solving reactions. So I'm going to solve reactions. I'm going to sum moments about point A just because that's how I started all my other reactions. And what do I get? Basically, all I get here is I get the moment at A, you know, minus P times uh, half a centimeter. So what's a half a centimeter? It's, or I'm sorry, half a centimeter. Uh, half a centimeter, half a centimeter. This is 50 centimeters, which is 0 0.5 meters. That S equals zero. All right, so the moment at A is just going to equal P, which is 15 times 0 0.5 or 7.5 kilonewton meters, right? So that's our moment at A. Uh, similarly, we can find our, our, our sum of the forces in the y direction equals zero. And what are we going to get here? We're just going to get Ay minus P equals zero. So Ay equals P or equals 15 kilonewtons. Right? And these, these concepts hopefully aren't that crazy. They're, they're pretty, pretty straightforward statics, right? So what are we going to do next? What, what we're going to do next is we're going to have to go find the combined stress, right? This combined stress. That's what we're, we're asked to solve for is this combined stress. So what does that look like? Well, typically what combined stress looks like is, well, well first let's just think about this section down here. If we, if we look at this section, right, what we have on, on, on this section is we have some force and we have some moment. So what that, what that indicates to me is that we're going to have some so I'm just going to cut this thing again. We're going to have some force and we're going to have some moment. Can you picture that? So basically we're just going to add these, these we're just going to add stresses to get them. So our combined stress is going to equal our axial stress. A lot of times the axial stress we'll call sigma. This is, I'll just call it sigma axial just to, just to, to be clear. But, and then we're going to have plus F, uh, you know, bending. So we're going to have our bending stress, or sometimes that'll be called F, sometimes you use S, sometimes you use sigma, depending on uh, where you came from and uh, how you learned it. Okay, but basically we're going to split this up. We're going to find our axial, we're going to do plus or minus our bending. And if we think about this for a second, right, let's, let's think about this for a second. So what do we have? 
we know that that what that uh that we have some compression going on here right so this stress is kind of like it's in compression do you agree so that that force is is pushing up these this, this force here is pushing up this force is pushing down that's causing this thing to compress vertically so our sigma axial is going to be if if i like to draw things with you know red and red for compression that's going to be compression does that make sense hopefully um and then if if we're looking at bending what do we have well on this side this is pulling away so on, on one side we have tension on the other side we're pushing towards we have compression right so on one side we're going to have this tension on the other side we're going to have compression because that's what bending does bending is this couple that it causes tension on one side compression on the other so what does that mean well if we take a look at this thing we're going to essentially have like tension on one side compression on the other uh maybe i'll draw it differently just to make it consistent here so if we have uh compression down we're going to have uh tension pulling up okay so we're going to have tension on one side compression on the other and this is going to be kind of our bending Does that make a little bit of sense so in the middle we're going to get the peaceful ones okay in the middle we're going to get the the, the peace the peacemakers because in the middle there's no stress in bending right so um that's that's where we're gonna go so let's take a look let's calculate our stresses and then we'll figure this out so first let's do axial stress axial stress we've kind of done before already tonight so axial stress is just going to be p over a and then we're gonna have plus or minus this bending stress right so the bending stress let's go and look up the bending stress here and what are we going to get uh we're going to get a bending stress of Oh, where do we go? I think that I just passed it. There we go. Uh, they use they use sigma here, so I should probably change my my notation. But sigma x is mc over i. Okay, sigma x mc over i. And let's go back here, and and I'll call this sigma x. You know, sig. I'm just gonna call this sigma bending because that's kind of what we're doing. Uh, but sigma x equals um, mc over i, where what where m is the moment, c is the distance from the neutral axis and i is uh the moment of inertia okay so let's just plug and chug and see what we get so so p we had was was what 15 kilonewtons i'm going to use um, I'm just going to actually go here and I'm going to say instead of 15 kilonewtons, I'm going to say I'm going to convert everything to um, newtons and millimeters. Why not? So 15,000 newtons divided by our area, which was, I think it was what? It was 10 centimeters. So it's going to be 100 uh, millimeters squared. So that's our axial force. Uh, then we're going to get plus or minus and we're going to get M was what 7.5 kilonewton meters so i need to do some unit conversions here so 7.5 kilonewton meters let's do our unit conversions so times a thousand newtons per kilonewton uh times a thousand uh, meters per or i'm sorry millimeters per meter okay so that gives us our m value here that gives us our our m and then c is going to be what it's going to be half uh half of of the section the section right so so here if if we have this section that's 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters c is going to go from the middle of that thing up and i didn't make it too complicated i made this square so this is going to be 50 millimeters okay so let's come back down here so we have our 50 uh, millimeters and i if you remember from last week uh a moment of inertia for a rectangle is going to be bh cubed actually let me write it up here i uh equals bh cubed over 12. we can go back to our shapes and find that but i'm just going to tell you what it is right now and because b equals h this is just going to be 100 uh, millimeters to the fourth divided by 12. now these signs make a little bit of a difference here right so these signs make a little bit of a difference uh, basically what we're told here is the the maximum i probably could have written in magnitude um 
the, the maximum, sorry, put magnitude on the other side to make this a little bit clearer, but the maximum magnitude uh, of the combined stress is most nearly, right? So, so here we need a sign convention. So if we have compression, a lot of times compression is negative, and a lot of times tension is positive, okay? So if we come back to our point here, we're at point A, right? So we're at point A. At point A, we're going to have um, compression over here. But for the bending, we're going to have tension, right? So what does that mean? So, so that means we're going to, if we call compression negative, we're going to include a negative sign for the compression. But we're going to come back down here and we're going to include a positive sign for the tension, right? So we said, we said that the axial is in compression, bending, and tension, and we have to get our signs right. So I'm going to do a negative here, uh, a, 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 positive, a positive here. And I think when this comes, works out, we get, well, 15,000. Uh, divided by 15,000 divided by 100 squared is going to be like 1.5 uh, megapascals. That's a negative, and then we're going to add in here 7.5 times 1,000 squared times 50 divided by 100 to the fourth. Uh, divide that or multiply the whole thing by 12, and I think that gets us to a 45 here. What that means is the total is going to equal 43.5 megapascals. And if we also wanted to know this, this is going to be in tension. Okay. The bending really controls this, but the compression lessens it a little bit. Okay. So that's going to get us up to answer B of 43.5 megapascals. So this is kind of is, is the most complicated problem that I think you could probably reasonably do in the three to five minute range. And the reason I say five minute is some of the questions are going to take you five minutes. Just, just being honest, right? Some of these questions aren't going to take you three minutes. They're going to be a little bit longer. And the reason that is, is because some of the questions are just qualitative like this next one. Do you know it or not? Right? So this next question is just a, a, a warm up question. Is mark the location the principal stresses on Morris circle. Right? What are principal stresses? Where are they? Where do they show up? And, and this is just like one of those qualitative questions, you know, you know, this is kind of maybe like an alternative uh, format question that you might need to, to answer, right? But the idea here is what is, what are principal stresses, right? And if we know that we're going to have some principal stresses, we're going to actually, maybe I'll make that one red just to make it look like compression, right? But basically we're going to have some principal stresses, uh, you know, in these locations. Did I spell principle wrong? <laughs> I think I might have. Let's let's look. Let's look. Oh man, it's killing me. Um, am I on mechanics and materials? So yeah, so mechanics and materials. We have some more circle stuff going on. No principle. It's 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 your pal. Okay, good. So the principal stresses. Um, these are the principal full stresses. Good. And then we know at these points here, these are going to be our, our shear stresses, right? So this is our, our shear stress or, or our max shear stress, right? And, and we can look at that on, on you know, at, at, this, at this point as well. When we have more circle, uh, basically what we have here is we have our maximum shear stress at the top and maximum shear stress at the bottom. We can have uh, our principal stresses at these points, sigma A, sigma B. Right, so we have sigma A is C plus R, sigma B is you know C minus R. So so these two points, these are gonna be our principal stresses, right? So so that's kind of a warm-up. It's also kind of a qualitative. Because some of the questions are gonna be like, do you know them or do you do you not? All right. I mean, some of them are you can maybe look this up in the in the um in the manual, but uh so I just saw a comment, why didn't you subtract? I'm not sure if that goes back to the last question. If it did, let me know and I'll go back there. Okay. So so we'll see where that goes. There's a little bit of a delay here. So uh, I think I got that right. So 45 minus 1.5 gets me to 43.5. Did I get that right? Hopefully. Okay. Well, I'm going to keep going unless there's...
the the okay so so i started with a plus or minus here because what we're saying okay so i think maybe the question is why did i subtract or why did i add and not subtract it's a great question so on with bending again we're looking at combined stresses and this is kind of like the combined stress at point a point a is on this side if i went to point b i could say point b is on this side okay in the combined stress i could say so so i could say like the i'm running out of room here but f combined for point b would equal to minus sigma axial minus is sigma bending and why is that that's because on on the right hand side this is compression and on the right hand side the bending is a compression so both of these become a uh, negative in that equation so i hope that makes a little bit more sense so if we were asked for the stress on at point b it would be negative 46.5 okay it'd be the it'd be the, we would take the negative 1.5 negative 46.5 or uh, 45 and we get a negative 46.5 altogether all in compression on that side and that's where you get the bending that's going sideways and the compression that's that's causing compression and they both cause compression on that side all right so hopefully that clarifies it a little bit if not come and see me matt i'll, I'll be around tomorrow okay so we're, what are we going to do next what we're going to do here is we are going to go to I know this last one, this is the last question again, combined stresses, these, this, something like this will probably show up on the, on the test, but this is where understanding uh, more circle kind of helps with these questions. It's, can you do it without more circle? Yeah, but it does it help with more circle. Yeah, it does. Uh, and, and honestly, I like to come back to what the reference handbook has to kind of explain this a little bit. So, uh, so basically when you get to more circle, what we have is an ax set of axes here. We have sigma or the normal stresses, the axial, the, the normal stresses that are per perpendicular to the surface along this axis. We have the, the shear stresses along the vertical axis. And what you see in this, there's different sign conventions and I've seen people to use different sign conventions in different books in different ways. But I really like what the FE does here. They tell you tau counterclockwise, tau, or I'm sorry, tau clockwise versus tau counterclockwise. Tau is typically that shear. Uh, letter that we use. So what's this going to look like? Well, basically we're going to start with, I'm just going to go draw my axes here and I'm going to draw, I'm just going to draw a set of axes. Why not? So if I draw a set of axes here and I'm just going to draw them kind of like this and then I'll label them as well. I'm going to label this tau clockwise, tau counterclockwise, and then this is sigma, right? So we have our, 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 our axes set up just like the FE did. And then we're going to come up with two points and, and basically we're going to use these values that we're given to come up with our points and what we're going to say is you know point one let's let's come up with point one we're going to be told that sigma x equals 30 uh, megapascals okay that's our first stress we know that tau equals 55 megapascals and you're, you're you're seeing here that we're only given one tau right so we only have this one uh shear stress but let's take a look at this right so so if we if we're looking at at our our normal stress here our sigma x where this is our our stress that's perpendicular to that face the normal stress is always perpendicular to the face it's normal to the face right whereas our shear stress is parallel to that face our shear stress is parallel to that face and i'm just going to take those shear stresses uh down here i'm going to say i'm going to show right this shear stress comes this way the shear stress comes that way which if you think about it that shear stress is going to cause a rotation in this direction which is what that's going to be counterclockwise you see it so what could i do i well i could come out here and i could take my first point and i'm going to go to 30 so i'll call this 30 and then i'm going to come down to you know minus 55 so minus 55 is down here and i'll just you know take that point and, and why minus 55 because it's counterclockwise okay so so i went minus because of the the counter clockwise Okay, then what's next? Well, point two, let's look at point two. We have sigma y, and that's gonna equal 90 megapascals, and you know tau is gonna equal 55 megapascals. And let's look at the, 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 the shear couple for that, right? So, so if this is our, uh, our, our axial force, sigma y, right, that's 90, we can see these shearing forces are going kind of to the left and the right depending on what you're looking at so the top is to the right the bottom is to the left and that's going to cause a rotation which is what clockwise 
right? So now we can come and we can plot this point. So we can come all the way out to 90, and we can go all the way up to 55 and plot that. So this is, you know, this is our, our point two. So this is kind of like point one. This is kind of like point uh, two, right? So we have those points plotted. And what you'll see here is actually, I'm going to move this down a little bit. Uh, what you'll see if we come back to our more circle is they create kind of this, this two points on a circle with the center being in between the two, which if I connect those two lines now, right? So if I connect those two points, I'm going to have this, this, this third point in the center, and that's going to be my sigma average. And what you can see is what we eventually want to get to is a circle out here. Let's see if I can draw a circle. I don't know if I can. We'll try. Um, if I draw a circle, eh, can I get it? Eh, not really. I can't get it the way I want it to. It, it's, it's not... It's not where I want it, but let me see if I can move it in the right spot. So I'll need to play with this a little bit to get it more circular and a little bit better here, but it's, it's getting close. It's going to be where about there. That looks more like a circle and it looks close to the two points. Okay. So, so not perfect, but it, it's, it's close. So what we want to do is we want to find essentially this radius R. So this is going to be our radius. And, you know, I could go back to those formulas. I could just completely work off those formulas and get the right answer. I'm just trying to give you a conceptual way so that if you're trying to save time on the test, you can think about this a little bit conceptually because everybody knows Pythagorean's theorem, I think, right? And what do we get? We get basically what R equals what? This sigma average, well, no, it's going to equal, you know, this distance, uh, let's call this x times this distance y squared. So r is going to equal the square root of x squared plus y squared, right? That, I mean, that's just, that's just basic Pythagorean theorem, right? And we know that this sigma average has to be what? The sigma average has to be 60 uh, megapascals. It's just halfway between 30 and 90. So that's going to be, and so, so we can solve this, right? We can solve r equals, uh, sorry, I already wrote r. So r equals the square root of uh, 60 squared plus what's y? Well, y we know is 55 squared. So, I'm sorry, I wrote that wrong again. This is 30 squared, right? Why is it 30? Because this distance here is 30, right? It's half the distance between the 30 and the 90 is going to be 30. That makes sense. 30 and 90 is 60. Divided by 2 is, is this 30 uh, megapascals. And then we get the 55 that goes up to 0 0.2. And we're pretty good. And I think that gets us to about like 62.65 megapascals, which and now, now all that we know is with more circle, we can come plus or minus, uh, you know, from the sigma average to get our maximum principal stresses. So, you know, sigma, let's look at this. Is sigma, you know, principal, sigma one and sigma two. Um, what are we going to get? We're going to get equal to essentially sigma average sigma one, two, our principal stress is going to be sigma average plus or minus r. Right, so that's just going to be equal to what? 60 uh, megapascals plus 62.65 or 60 megapascals minus 62.65. So we get what? 122.6 or, you know, minus, I think, 2.6 or 2.7, you know, 2.65, 2.65. And here I got a little sloppy with my units, but these are all megapascals. And hopefully uh, you can see that this still gives us an answer here of, if I circled the right one, it gives us an answer of the, the minus 3 and, and 122. Okay. So I didn't get into twisting this element. I didn't get into angles like that because that, that gets a little messy too. But I just wanted to get the basics down here of this more circle and what this looks like. Kind of how to look at it, how to use it. This two phi is is another thing where it, when you're rotating it, um, you have to be careful because you have to divide the angle by two. Um, alternately, you could just go plug and chug this thing, right? You could just plug and chug. There's an equation for it. You can plug and chug, and it'll work. Uh, there's also, I think, a plug and chug formula up here. So if you'd want, if you're if you're more comfortable with just going and plugging and chugging, this formula will get you the same answers as well. Okay. So that's kind of the, you know, the bulk of it. But I, I kind of wanted to get in there just a little bit, show you a little bit of more circle. 
I'll take a take a walk down there and, and make it work. So you know, I I this that's it. That's all I got for tonight. I mean, I normally our sessions aren't going to go two hours, but um the, these first ones, I think static strength materials, math, those these ones are like oh man they're important and i think i hope this is helpful i mean like honestly i really do and if you have suggestions definitely give me comments in the in the bottom below i've, I've tried to do better to make fewer mistakes here uh and uh improve audio quality i might go back and re-record some of those other ones because the audio wasn't that good and um i'll even try to get better jokes like um like if there's any spanish speakers out there i just want to say mucho because i know it means a lot to you and if you didn't think that was funny i'll just say mundo because I, I, I know it means the world to you. Sorry, that was really bad. But, um, you know, I, I, do, I do hope that this, uh, this helps and uh, it helps you prepare for the FE, all, all bad jokes aside. So, um, you know, a, until next time. Next week we should be doing another one and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go for it then. So, until next time, hey, keep working hard. Keep, uh, keep moving onward and upward.